right into that. So guys, let's start that bumper. So we have spent the last six weeks walking through the different miracles of Jesus and how they bring us to a place of abundant life. And, uh, and it's, a, it's been an amazing study, and I'm really excited about it. But you, as your pastor, I want you to know something about me. There is almost not a Sunday goes by, if I'm being honest, there's not really a Sunday that ever goes by, that I don't feel completely inadequate to get up here with a microphone strapped to my face and tell you how you should be living your life. Well, there's a Sunday every year that I feel really ill-equipped to get up here and say anything. And it's Mother's Day because I'm not a mom. And I thought, you know what? I, I think I know someone who would be really amazing at this and provide a, a, great, um, a, a great talk for us. And so I asked our women's ministry director if she would be willing to come up and share her heart with us today. And so if you guys would, give a huge Baymer Church welcome to Miss Helen Jean Thompson. <laughs> Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. So, um, funny thing, I just got glasses because I can't see. So today I had to decide, do I want to see the crowd and read the room or do I want to read my notes? So I chose my notes, but I can't see y'all at all. So if you want to give me a little hoot and holler or a word of encouragement while I'm up here, that would be great. <laughs> all right. Do you know how Mother's Day came to our calendar? Do you know why we celebrate Mother's Day on the second Sunday of May? Well, I happen to be a professional at why and how come questions, because at mo as mothers, we answer 5,968 of them per kid per day. So I did a little research, and of course, you can date Mother's Day celebrations as far back as ancient Roman and Greek times, but I was interested in finding out how it came to the U.S. So in the years before the Civil War, there was a woman by the name of Anna, Anne, I'm sorry, Ann Reeves Jarvis, and she lived in West Virginia, and she helped to start Mother's Day work clubs where she gathered the local women and taught them how to properly care for their children. These clubs later became a unifying force in a region of the country that was still divided by civil war. And in 1968, Jarvis organized Mother's Friendship Day, at which she had mothers come and gather with former Union and Confederate soldiers to promote reconciliation. Of course, they'd put mothers to the job of making people get along. So she ended up the official Mother's Day arose after Ann Jarvis's death, when her daughter Anna Jarvis conceived of Mother's Day as a way of honoring sacrifices that mothers make for their children. She ended up getting the financial back backing from some bigwig department store owner in Philadelphia, and she pushed to have this holiday added to our national calendar, arguing that men had plenty of hol holidays for their achievements. Her persistence paid off, and in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson 
signed a measure officially establishing the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day. Anna later resented the fact that Mother's Day quickly became commercialized with florists and card-making companies that were cashing in on her holiday, and she spent the rest of her life and her life savings filing lawsuits against these companies. So that by her death in 1948, she had despised and disowned Mother's Day altogether. So there you have it. Maybe next year, or this year if you haven't gotten your card yet, you can hand make a card in honor of Miss Anna. Now it's not a secret to me that Mother's Day can be one of the most difficult days to go to church. I have been there. I have lived it. For some of us, it's hard because we find ourselves for the first time the inability to say Happy Mother's Day to our own mom. She's here, and then she's gone. And for others, we never had a great relationship with our mother, and we don't understand why they get a day. And we grieve what we never had. And for some, the desire to become a mom is so strong and so painfully overwhelming. And it just hasn't happened yet. We get tired of telling well-meaning people that our time has just not yet come. Mother's Day, when you're walking through infertility, is a big slap in the face. I walked through 10 Mother's Days while we were waiting on our children. 10 years worth of waiting and hoping and praying for a miracle. I hated Mother's Day. I despised it. It was for someone else. Seemingly, it was for everyone else. So if you find yourself in that place today, where you're missing what once was, or you're grieving what you never had, or it just hasn't happened yet. I want to encourage you, and I want to say thank you for being here. And I trust that the Lord sees your heart, and he's already at work to fill that void, to make a way to find peace, to bring restoration, or to breathe life into your womb. When Laddie asked me last Saturday... If I would bring today's message, I'm not going to lie, I was scared, I was ready to run, had my cell phone, and I was forming my decline when the voices in my head of what I might say got louder than my no. And so I said yes. And before I had too long to think about it, I, I mean, I said yes. So thankfully, before I got too anxious, the Lord calmed my fears and reminded me that he's been with me way too long for me to get riled up at the idea of talking about him. That doesn't take away all the nerves, but it got me up here, and now I'm trapped. So <laughs> we've been talking about miracles for the last six weeks. Well, miracles and motherhood are a big part of my story. So I want to spend some time with you today speaking about what we can do while we're waiting. Where is my miracle God, where are you? But first, I'd like to share my story. Many of you have heard parts of this. Some have heard Tim's perspective during Wesley's baptism years ago. But I took some time this week, and I read through my emails, and I read through my journal, journal entries, three years' worth of content. And I reminded myself of all the pain and all of the tears and all of the up and ups and the downs, so it's super fresh. And I promise I'll give you the Cliff Notes version, just the highlights. So here it goes. But I want to start with this. If you are ready to start a family, and it, it doesn't matter how long you um, are made to wait, it is difficult. The moment it doesn't work out the way you think it should, it's heartbreaking. So I felt the same way six months into this journey as I did 106 months into it. That feeling didn't change. So all that to say, if this is your now, I see you, and my decade-long story doesn't make yours any less. But I'd say about seven years into our journey, we were getting serious about trying to find out why our family wasn't growing. Before that, it was, well, we're young, and if it happens, it would be great. Um, but by 2008, we were knee-deep in medications and specialists and testing and exploratory surgeries, anything to find answers. I didn't tell too many people about these struggles, mostly to protect myself from well-meaning people that 
would say things that are supposed to be sweet but weren't so helpful at all. Did you know that God puts certain people in your lives during certain seasons for a reason? They are there to push you, to sharpen you, to speak in a way that, that no one else can because part of their story is relevant to yours. Well, there were some people, their names were Chuck and Bobby, and they were so full of faith. And they had walked this infertility road before. And they were an integral part of the foundation of our marriage and our faith as young adults. And we let them in. And they walked the road with us. Well, it was one random Tuesday that this friend came to my house to give me a gift. And it was these two onesies that you see up here. And she told me, you need to be praying for twins. A double blessing is coming your way. Pray big. And I said, okay. And I tucked the onesies aside, and the thought of twins was both wonderful and terrifying, and we kept keeping on. In 2010, we became pregnant after a round of IVF. And immediately, before even seeing this baby's heartbeat, this baby was loved. We were starting our family. But on June 16th, 2010, we lost that baby, and I spent my 30th birthday, the day that I had hoped to share this bundle of joy with the world, instead grieving the loss. I vividly remember that day, seeing a fork in the road. I could go one way, and we could forget everything, and we could live for ourselves, and I could go back to school, and I can get that advanced degree, and we can buy the house and the car, and we can travel the world, or I can go this way, and put all my faith in one basket and keep pursuing the family that we believed we were meant to have. I could let this pain kill my faith or increase it. And I was angry and I yelled at God for a long time. But did you know that God can handle our anger? Anger is not a sin. It's what we do with it that gets us into trouble. He can take it. And I decided I was going to stir my faith. And I told God that if I went down this road again... I was going to need him to knock my socks off. I was going to need him to do so, something so big, so unexpected, that I was forever blown away. Tim and I promised we would not mention the word infertility for six months. We were depleted physically, spiritually, emotionally, and financially. But about four months in, I came to him and I said, remember that thing we're not supposed to talk about? I'm ready to talk about it. And we stayed, we stayed on the same page. She was always so supportive. We were on the same team. And if for some reason we weren't, we would pause. But there it was, beginning of 2011, we started everything again. Not only were we believing for twins, but we were believing specifically for two blastocysts. Blasts are the stage of an embryo right before implantation. We didn't want any frozen embryos, just weren't comfortable with it. But we kept that part to ourselves because I didn't want the doctor making any decisions based on my conversations with God. And I'll tell you that detail because it's important. My IVF experience was not perfect. My body did not react the way it was supposed to. We had to keep increasing the meds and keep increasing the meds. And all these meds count, cost thousands of dollars. But would you believe, in the end, we had two beautiful blastocysts. God heard our prayer, and he answered to the detail. I'm sure many of you could name those adorable little blastocysts today, although they're not so little anymore. But the story doesn't end there. We heard the words thick, nuchal cord, Down syndrome, Down syndrome infalcial, poor placental perfusion, what to expect if baby A doesn't make it. At 20 weeks, the contraction started. The prayers never stopped. And after 90 days of strict bed rest, 47 of them in the hospital, we delivered our twins at 32 weeks at 2 pounds, 4 ounces, and 3 pounds, 12 ounces. Then the journey of keeping them here began. There were more diagnosis, aspiration issues, failure to thrive. But we're thriving now. God saw us through it all, and then he blew my socks off because he blessed us with another 16 months later, and then another while the twins were still three. And I'm on the other side to tell you that if you're hoping and praying for a miracle of any kind 
fertility, a relationship that needs restoring, that cancer that needs healing, that addiction that needs crushing. Maybe the anxiety and the depression is crippling you. My God can do it. I have seen him move. I want to spend some time today talking about what we can do in the waiting when we are exhausted and weary. So let's revisit some of the miracles that Laddie spoke of earlier in this season. First, we have the bleeding woman. Now, this story is found in at least three of the Gospels, but I like the way Luke tells it best. He was a physician. So let's go to Luke chapter 8, 43 through 48. And it says, A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years, who had spent all she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any, approached from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming in on you and pressing against you. Everybody's touching you. Someone did touch me, said Jesus. I know the power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him in the presence of all the people. She declared the reason she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It said she suffered for 12 years. How hopeless she must have felt until she found or heard the name of Jesus. Because of Jewish law, her life was impossible. She was consistently considered unclean. And it was common belief in those days that if a person had an outward affliction, it must be because of some hidden inward sin. She was shunned, but she was tenacious, and she had faith, and she fought the crowds. If only she could touch her robe. And Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We talked about Jesus feeding the 5,000 in John chapter 6, verse, 18, verse 8 through 13. And it says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Peter, Andrew Simon's Peter brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. The young boy had five loaves and two fish. Wait, there's one more. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. 12 baskets. The boy had the, had the five loaves and the two fish. That's it. But Jesus did the miracle. That he had to offer up the five loaves. The boy had to do that first. The disciples had to bring it to Jesus. The miracle happened through their obedience. They had to bring to the table the little bit they had, the seemingly meaningless when compared to the crowd. But Jesus took what was offered, fed the masses with endless leftovers. So we're a family of six. I cook dinner every night. And I don't know about you guys, but if we have any leftovers at the end of the night, it is a miracle. They had 12 baskets. Okay, we're going to go back to Luke for one more. We have the paralyzed man. So Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. One of the, on one of those days while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem. And the Lord's power to heal was with him. Just then some men came carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed, They tried to bring him in and set him down before him, 
Since they could not, could not find a way in to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the roof tiles into the middle of the crowd before Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Seeing their faith, the friend's faith, he said, your sins are forgiven. There's a few more verses where the scribes and the Pharisees are being annoying, but in verse 25, it says, immediately he got up before them, picked up his mat, and went home glorifying God. Thank God for good friends. This guy couldn't get to Jesus even if he tried, but his friends had such incredible faith that they were willing to tear through a roof to get him to Jesus. Can I please be a friend like that? You may have noticed a pattern. Each of these miracles came about because someone stepped out in faith. They didn't wait for Jesus to come to them, to ask them what they needed. They pursued him, standing firm in the belief that not only was he able to give them their miracle, but that he was willing. So I ask you, what is your role in your miracle? What are you bringing to the table? Do you need to step out in faith? Do you need to offer what you have and let God do the rest? Do you need to ask for forgiveness in that relationship that needs restoring? Do you need to humble yourself and admit that hidden addiction and ask for help? Maybe you're the friend. Maybe God is using you in someone else's miracle. Surround yourself with good friends. Now, maybe you'd say to me, Helen Jean, these people could literally walk up to Jesus. They could pursue him in the flesh, which I would say, we have this. We have the word of God, and we have access to Jesus every day, any time of day. This word is life. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, and it says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It tells us to pray with thanksgiving. I was reminded the other weekend at the Favored Women's Conference that it's impossible to worry and worship at the same time. Can't do it. You cannot worry with your brain and worship with your heart at the same time. So let's praise him in the storm. Tell him your needs, your desires, but don't forget to thank him for what he's already done and what he has yet to do. And then watch with expectancy, but be prepared for unexpected answers. I'm so thankful for all of my not yet answers earlier in life. God knows what he's doing. If we were meant to be parents of four children in three years, and I was 22 and 23 and 24, and my frontal lobe was not even fully developed yet, Lord, help them. Help us. But God knows what he's doing. Trust in his timing. Another thing we can do while we're in the waiting is to flood our hearts and our minds with his promises. Remind yourself of his promises, but believe that they are for you. God's promises are pure, and our prayers are powerful and effective, and they can move the very hand of God. Because the grave is empty. That's right. Because the grave is empty. Everything is possible for him who believes. Mark 9, 23. God is our redeemer. He's our provider. He's our healer. He's our creator. He's the beginning and the end. He is with you. He is for you. He will strengthen you. He brings peace and rest to those who seek it. He is our rescuer. He is our protector. Fill your brain with these things. Meditate on them and memorize them. Do you remember life before the cell phone? Anybody? 
Can you tell me how many cell phone numbers did you have memorized back in the day? I, I would say I had dozens. All my friends had them all memorized. Do you know how many I know now? Four. I know my cell phone number, the same cell phone number I've had since cell phones existed. I have Tim's cell phone number memorized. I have my childhood cell phone number memorized. That doesn't mean no good anymore. And his childhood cell phone memorized. That's it. Our brains have the capacity to hold 2.5 million gigabytes of memory. What's that equivalent to? Well, I'm a homeschool mom, so Siri and I are best friends. It's a love-hate relationship, right? So I asked her, and she said it's equivalent to 3 million hours of TV shows. Do you know how long your TV has to run to go through all of that data? 300 years. So I know memorizing can be hard. It takes time. But we can do hard things. Memorizing is not for an elite group of certain people who have this amazing skill. We can all do it. And having those thoughts, those promises locked in can sustain us when things get tough. When we don't have the energy to open our Bible or we don't have the words to pray. I want to tell you about a friend of mine. I knew her as Miss Natalie maybe two months ago. She wasn't feeling well, and she felt dizzy, and she just knew something was off. So she went to the ER, and she was full of fear of the unknown while she waited on the scans and the tests. But then she heard the diagnosis, and it was cancer her brain and her liver and her lungs and her kidneys. And after a moment of processing and listening to what the doctors could do to maybe give her a little more time and hearing them say the likelihood that she would not be healed, she told that doctor he was wrong and that she would find healing and that death had no hold on her and that the victory has been won. And she went home and she loved her family well, and her family loved her well. And she went to the beach, and she went to the mountains, and she proclaimed the assurance of her salvation to anyone who would listen. And we had a party in her backyard, and we ate endless sugar, endless sugar, and praised Jesus. There was a praise band there, sugar, Jesus, and friends. My children thought they were in heaven. They were having the time of our li their lives. It was amazing. And every one of her friends and family and friends of friends got the opportunity to tell her what she meant to them. The last time I saw her was Tuesday, April 23rd, and she was at an award ceremony for her grandchildren. And she was frail, and she was in a wheelchair and on oxygen. But she was smiling, and she was glowing with God's peace and joy, even as her earthly body was failing her. And on Wednesday, she went to church, not because she had the strength to be there, but because she wanted to see her church family. And on Thursday, it was clear that her kidneys were failing. And on Saturday, she went to be with our Lord. But her last words to her family were, heaven is real, y'all. I want you to know heaven is real. I tell you her, the, her story because she got her miracle and because she also waited well. She was so full of God's promises that they carried her through to the next chapter. Now, the last thing that we can do while we're in the waiting, the last thing I want to talk to you about today is to, oh, I forgot to do that, surround yourself with good people. Find someone you can confide in. Tell someone. Find some friends like the paralyzed man's friends. Share your story. Sharing your story allows God the opportunity to use your pain for good. It brings hope. And remember all the things he's already done. Write them down. Because this 2.5 million gigabytes of memory does not serve us well. Because we forget what he has already done. 
even if you haven't received your answer yet. Journaling is a spiritual practice that can expand God's peace and joy. And it allows us to see God moving even when we aren't on the other side yet. I want to end with this thought. The enemy would love for your life to be focused on what you're waiting for so that you miss the destiny that God has for you. The enemy would love for your life to focus, for, love the focus of your life to be on what you are waiting for so that you miss what God has for you. So engage in the lives of others. Invest time and effort with the people the Lord has given you today and find a way to be the answer to someone else's prayer. So what can we do in the waiting? Find out what your role is in the miracle. Do you need to step out in faith? Do you need to offer what you have to God and let him do the rest? Flood your heart and your mind with his promises. Memorize and meditate on his word and let it sustain you when the road gets tough. And then find people who will walk with you because we're not promised an easy road. There's no reason for us to walk it alone. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for who you are and that you are not only able to hear our prayers, but you are willing. Thank you for your word and that it carries us when the road gets hard. And thank you for this church and for each other to spur one another on, to encourage one another in this walk. I thank you for the fact that you are with us no matter where we are in our journey, no matter where we are with, with waiting for something big from you, that you are in it with us. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, 